Hey everybody, my name is Jason, also known as Pirate JC, and welcome to another Babylon video. Today, we're checking out part four of our hex tile demo video series. That's a mouthful. If you don't remember what it is that we're building, let me show you. It's this awesome hex tile grid where you can select any given tile and you have a 50-50 chance of generating procedural noise-based islands. How cool is that? So we're on part four and today's a super special one because because we get to dive into the node material editor. That's right. It is time to start building and analyzing the shaders that we're going to need to create this demo. So to, without any further ado, let's jump right on in where we left off from the last video. This is what we're going to be creating today. It's going to be the top surface, the not even the full thing. We don't have the question mark yet. It's just the sort of the liquidy noise kind of shimmery effect that happens on the top surface. Uh, and I'm going to walk through how we create that together. But before we dive into the node material editor, we need to set up our code to be able to assign a node material to uh, the top surface of any given hex tile. So here's how we do this. The first thing is, notice that where we previously had the hex uh, create hex grid, where we're calling that function, I've now encapsulated that into uh, node material load. Okay. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm creating a variable called water material top. Then I'm loading in a node material material. Uh, asynchronously from a specific um, snippet. Uh, and then I'm going to say, okay, the, the output of this, the result of this load is I'm going to set water material top to that node material. And then I'm going to say water material top dot name in is equal to water material top, uh, which is, you know, just again, I like to use names that are really, really easy and keep myself organized as we go. And then I'm calling the create hex grid. However, it's changed slightly. I've added a new variable that we're going to pass into it, which is the water material top. That is the new node material, okay? And the reason I've done that is because now in the create hex grid, we have this new section which says, get all of the child meshes of the selected um, of the selected mesh, the selected hex, excuse me, loop through them. And then if any of them have the name of top, set that material of that particular mesh equal to the water material top, and then set the vertex alpha uh, to false just to make it look uh, the way that I want it to look. Okay, so now it's set up and it obviously has a node material. And I want to get in and show you this node material and how I've pieced it all together. But before we do, I'd actually like to show you how to use noise and the noise node in the node material editor from a, from a fresh session from scratch. So you can bring up a new browser tab or window and type in nme.babylonjs.com. That stands for node material editor.babylonjs.com. And you're presented with this. It's a pretty, pretty simple uh, node structure that we need to drive a shader for any given mesh or for, for a material. Okay, so I'm gonna take these three nodes here. I'm gonna bring them way over here. And let's just start right on in by grabbing the simplex Perlin 3D noise. Okay, I'm gonna just show you this uh, with the fragment output, which is basically just the color of the shader for now. Okay, and so I'm going to take uh, this the world position of my mesh. I'm gonna get random noise. Now here uh, I've just got this white color. I'm gonna get rid of that, and instead I'm gonna pass in the noise right into the fragment output. And boom, look at that. We've got noise, and that's it for today's video. I'm totally kidding. There's a lot more that we're gonna go over today. Don't worry. But this is great. So this is shows how powerful that node is to be able to create uh, noise, basically, uh, simplex noise, which is awesome. However, we actually want to start to modify it and have control over it to be able to design and shape it to the way that we like, right? So we need to expand upon this a little bit. So the first thing that we want to be able to do is, let's say that we want to see this uh, noise move. We don't actually want it to move over time. Well, that's we can do that. We can definitely handle that. First thing I'm going to grab is a vector splitter, okay? So I'm going to take the world position, I'll take the vector four, and I'm going to split that out into individual channels. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go grab time and two add nodes, okay? Add and add. And then we're also going to need a uh, vector merger, okay? So let's go grab vector merger. So what I'm essentially going to do is I'm going to take 
I'm, by the way, going to do a lot of reorganizing as I go here, just kind of moving nodes around. I'm going to take time and put it in the left channel of both of these add nodes, okay? And then the top add node, I'm going to pass X in, and the bottom add node, I'll pass uh, Z in to the right channel of both of those add nodes. And then what I'm going to go do is, let's take this vector merger, we'll just pass Y right across for now, but then for X and for Z, I'm going to pass those into this vector merger. And now I have a new seed for this simplex Perlin 3D node that I can pass in that's affected by time. And so there, just by hooking that up, now my noise moves over time. And this is awesome. This is definitely something we can leverage to create a cool shimmery effect. Okay, so what's the next thing that we want to do with it? Well, let's say that this is great, but I want it to go faster or slower. Shouldn't I be able to dial in how fast that moves? Yeah, let's do that. That's going to be pretty simple, actually. We just need two nodes to do that. We need a multiply node, and we're going to pass that in here, and then we can pull out a float. Now, this float, let's call this noise speed, okay? And we'll give it an initial value of one. And then instead of passing time into these two add nodes, we're going to pass in multiply, uh, this multiply. And now, Ta-da, we have the same exact thing. However, we now have a variable that we can control to make it go much, much faster or much slower if we prefer. There we go, okay. So that's awesome. Now we can control time and we've got this lever that we can play with uh, to be able to help us shape this particular noise to kind of how we want it. Okay, let's say the next thing that we want to do is to be able to shape the scale of the noise, right? Right now we've kind of got this blobby, cloudy, we're very close into the noise. Well, what if I wanted to expand way out and have very fragmented and frantic noise? Okay, well, we can do that too. That's actually another really, really simple one. We're going to grab a scale node. Now, a scale node is basically a multiplication of a vector. Uh, in, in the Babylon world here. So we're going to connect the output of the vector merger. We're going to pull out a float. We'll save, uh, put it at one for now, pass that back into the simplex Perlin 3D, and it looks exactly the same. However, we can also make that really, really tight and crazy noise, or we can even go even more blobby if we wanted with it. The point is we now have control with this float, which we're going to name, you guessed it, noise scale. Okay, so let's put this at two for now, and we're gonna drag that over here. This is gonna be our pile of, uh, of levers that we can kind of design and play with for this shader. Uh, the next thing that we wanna be able to do is change the direction of the noise. Now, to do this, we're gonna use a super, super handy technique that has to do with the relationship between cosine and sine. And to show you that, here's I'm going to switch over to the Desmos graphing calculator, which is an amazing website to kind of help you visualize math. It's definitely for a visual person, something like me, this is super, super handy. So let's take a look at the relationship between sine and cosine. If you look at this cosine curve here, when the cosine of x uh, is at 1, the sine of x is at 0. Now, a lot of you already know this, but still, it's a really, really handy thing to, to use. And inversely, when the sine is at 1, the cosine is at 0. And it works below 0 as well. Cosine's at negative 1, sine's at 0. Uh, sine is at negative 1, cosine is at 0. So we are going to use that to our advantage, OK? So we're going to switch back over here. And I'm going to bring out two floats. I'm going to bring out uh, also a multiply node. Actually, I think I'm going to bring out uh, three of these. Yeah, I want three multiply nodes. Okay, so we'll put these over here for now. Okay, so what I want to be able to do is I want to say I'm going to create a variable. This one I'm going to call pi because it's going to be, you guessed it, 3.14. And then I am going to call this one noise speed. Nope, sorry, I lied. That's noise direction. <laughs> okay, and that is going to be a slider and it's going to go from negative one to one, okay? And that's fine, it can start at zero. We'll connect these up into this multiply node, okay? So now this value of negative one to one is actually outputting negative pi to pi. And so now what I want to do actually is I want to go grab the sine and cosine nodes. So I'll grab the cosine first, and then we'll grab the sine node and stack them together. I'm going to take negative pi to pi and pass that into both the cosine and the sine node. 
And then what I want to do is I want to multiply that. We'll pass that into the right channel of both. So the cosines going into the top multiply, sines going into the bottom multiply, both in the right channels. Then I'm going to take this time multiplication and I'm going to pass that in to the left channels here. Okay. And then I'm going to give myself more space because we have tons and tons of space, might as well use it. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is move these over. And now I'm going to pass this multiple, these two multiply nodes in for X and Y in replacement of time. So basically over time, we're going to be uh, uh, able to oscillate and change that direction. Okay, so that's going to be passed into the left channel of both. And now if I've done this correctly, you'll notice that our noise is now moving in one direction, but it's moving in a different direction, it's moving up. So then what I can do is I can take this noise direction and as I dial it and change it, notice that the direction totally changes just with a little slider. That's pretty cool. That is definitely something that is super, super handy. So now I essentially have three different levers or variables that I can play with to shape the noise. And that's a super, super cool thing. So the next thing that I want to do is I'm just going to organize this just a little bit for myself here. We'll bring all these down over here and pass the scale, the noise. Okay. And then I'm going to create a frame around them. We're going to call this noise and we'll give it a different color. Let's call it blue. And guess what? We can collapse that to make it look nice and easy. And now we have this noise, which again, I can shape and change to my heart's desire here. Okay, well, guess what? We now can also use this to modify the Y value of each individual vertex over time. And so that's what can give us the kind of height of the rippling effect. And here's how we're going to do that. We're going to take a vector merger. We'll put it right over here for right now. And we're gonna go hook up X, Z, and W into this, okay? And then for the Y value, what we're going to do is we're going to add the Y value to this new Y value, and we're gonna pipe that into Y. And when we do that, the output of this node, this vector merger node, it is now ready to change the height of our surface. How cool is that? That's pretty, oh, right, you can't even see it. Let me get rid of my picture in picture here. There you go. So now you can see the representation, sorry about that, of here is the noise and here is uh, how we're using it to affect the color. And again, uh, that's through the fragment output, as well as the height through the vertex output. So that is something I wanted to show you how you can use that to actually create sort of a noise-based wave. And now what you can imagine is how we're going to start to layer those together. So now after we've done all of that, I'm going to close this, actually we'll just switch over to the actual node material that we're pulling in. It is water material top, okay? And I'm gonna to go to node material editor and I'm gonna load that up. Now it might look a little bit daunting, but don't worry, we're gonna go through it. In fact, most of it we already just did go through. In fact, let's start with these blue frames. Notice that I have my wind speed. I'm calling it wind and noise. I get I mix those up all the time, go back and forth. So I've got speed, scale, and I've got direction. Those are the three variables that I want to play with for, yes, you guessed it, for noise. So I'll drag this frame up just to show you, but that is what we just created together. Now, the only difference here that you're seeing is there's these two multiply nodes. That's because I have a master scale and speed as well. So in addition to me wanting to be able to create to dial in any given set of noise, I also have one that's going to affect all of the noise overall. And so then we layer things. We basically add multiple different noises together. So this is a simplex Perlin uh, noise here, here, and here. This is a different type of noise. It's a whirly noise. Uh, this, the process is basically very, very similar, um, but you can open this up and check it out. Uh, but it's basically very, very similar to what we walked through. It just has one additional variable to kind of dial in a cell-like structure. Not going to go into that, but the point of it is we have a bunch of noise together and you can now add these together. So the output of this node right here is all of this noise, the result of all of this noise kind of being added together, which is really, really cool. That's definitely something that we're uh, going to be able to leverage and use, particularly for both the color and for the uh, for the height, okay? Now, 
This is where things get a little bit interesting. The first thing is let's check out the color, okay? So I uh, am going to uh, show you the fragment output, which is here. So what I'm doing is there's these remap nodes. Now I want the color to change and be adjustable independently of the height, uh, how I'm affecting the waves. And so I'm actually using different remap nodes to remap from negative one to one to some different variables, okay? And so uh, in this case, actually I'm going from negative four to four and then smashing it down. But the gist of this is, is that I'm taking this particular remap node and I am passing that right into a gradient. So instead of black to white, I'm now using a shaped gradient that goes from dark blue up to a light blue, and then finally, if we got high enough, up to a white. And I kind of shaped the, the look of, of the color um, based on this gradient node. So when you pass the noise to it, the values of zero to one map into this exact gradient. And then we just pass that right on into the fragment output. So now we've got all these layered noises together that affect that entire plane. Okay, so that's the fragment output. That's awesome, right? And you can mess with these variables and play with them to your heart's content. So then out of this add node here, I'm also going into this remap node. Now this remap node is a little bit different because this one is being multiplied against this odd thing. It's a texture. And I'm using this texture that is simply black and white, where white is a, is a hexagon. I'm using this as a mask. When you multiply the output of here against this, remember that white is one and zero is black. So I'm multiplying and the result of this output here is it's only going to affect the change, the, the, the um, altitude uh, or amplitude of the waves. It's only gonna uh, change it at all of this plane inside of the hexagon. So it's really hard to see here, but let me, uh, raise this value up a bit and you can start to see what I'm talking about. So you start to see more height here, right? You can see more height, but if you look carefully, you'll notice it's actually only happening inside of this hexagon, meaning over here in the corners, it's not actually affecting the height at all. The fragment output is being affected. We're giving it color, but we're not doing that. And the reason I'm doing that, the reason I'm masking the hexagon is so that I don't get any weird, um, uh, things happening inside the border mesh of each of my hexagons. Basically, I want to confine it all to inside of the border of the hex tile. So that border mesh that surrounds each hex tile, I don't want to see any change in Y because I don't want it to feel like it's crashing through it. I want it to feel like it's contained inside of it. And so that's why I'm basically confining it into the hex that fits inside of that border. So that's what I'm using for the mask right there. And that essentially is it. That's the whole node material. It's using noise, changing the parameters, laying them, layering them all together, passing that to the fragment output, and passing that to the um, uh, to the vertex output, and then giving it different values. Now, in this case, I've changed this um, value here, so we're going to get some pretty crazy results uh, over in our. Um, uh, actual scene here. But remember, what I can do is I can just dial that all the way back. So I can go, uh, let's see, where was that? That was right here. I can take that back to 0.7, I think it was, something like that, and get back to kind of what I had, which is this beautiful uh, surface that has a little tiny, tiny bit of, uh, of amplitude uh, where it gets a little higher, where the noise gets a little higher. So that's it. That's really it for today. I hope this has been a helpful video. We're diving into using noise and the super handy Simplex Perlin 3D node inside the node material editor to create an amazing shader, or at least the basis for a shader. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope you've learned something from it. I hope you're enjoying this series that I'm doing on the hex tile grid and how I'm creating this kind of game board asset. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down in the comments down below. And if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to this channel so that you don't miss any of the future updates that we do. Thank you so much for checking this out and we'll see you next time.